Pues, buenas tardes to everybody. Um, this is our fourth time around um, for the Latinx Public Voice Series in Good Company. And um, tonight, our Good Company is with Cristina Rivera Garza. And it's really a pleasure to be able to do this because we have actually, we've crossed paths, I think, uh, at um, a conference, she tells me. <laughs> and, and with my memory, I don't know these days whether I remember everything so well, but, but we have never actually sat down and had a real conversation. So I am so grateful for the opportunity, and I'm, um, I'm looking forward to these two hours. Um, what I want to say before we begin, though, any further in this, of course I want to thank the people that um, have supported us in doing this process, um, you know, in terms of our co-sponsors, Chicano Studies Institute, the Department of English, the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, the Multicultural Center. But I think what I first want to say is um, what's on the minds of probably many of us um, is really, you know, I realized when we were talking, we had the idea for Latinx Public Voice. The line is through the lens of I in the name of we. And um, I think that what is happening in Palestine now is mm -hmm. something that um, I can't help but feel that resonate um, with all of the terror that's happening. Um, through the lens of I in the name of we, it is, it is us. Um, I think for many, many years, um, Chicanos have had a particular relationship to the Palestinian experience in that certainly we're not talking about, I mean, we've all have suffered great violences, but in the sense of feeling like somehow even those of us and in indigenous peoples that were originally here still kind of suffer a, a, a certain second-class citizenship. But more cruelly and crucially even than that, is a sense that what all one knows, what they're talking about now, what's going on, is always the same, same argument, which is Israel is defending itself. And what we understand is that a nation state does not have the right to defend itself from the very people it has colonized. It's just not true. It's not legal. And so I feel like there's a, we can apply these kinds of thoughts to our, to our own people you know, those of you in the audiences, you know, this audience out here and the people that come to see um, uh, the Latinx public voice, all we're talking about is this relationship that, that, that nations of people, people that identify themselves as a nation of people, regardless of nation state, you know, what is then um, our role within those nation states? You know, what, what is our freedom call? Where are the walls? Where are the walls that are being put up? And um, certainly, as we go into this, this evening's conversation with uh, Cristina, we're going to also talk about those walls, talk about the walls, talk about the, the whole movement of people that have been pushed from their lands. And Palestinians is a case in point. They have been people, people now, I mean, since I can, can remember, have been pushed from their lands. And When, we under, when people really want to talk about settler colonialism, that's what we need to talk about. That's what's really going on. So um, I didn't um, prepare a speech, but I think all I'm trying to do is um, I want to put out to us, and it will come up again in, in today's conversation, and I know my sisters here share a common cause with me in this, um, but I just want to, um, well, also, I guess I just want to say that um, uh, that prayers, you know, that I feel a sense of that on a certain level, however you do that, you know, that they need our energy, they need our prayer, they need our spirit, and they need our activism. They need us also to um, uh, boycott Israel. And uh, uh, we need to put our thoughts into action. Um, so having um, said all that, I, I feel like um, I'm actually in really good hands to say that um, because of who is our guest today. 
Um, this is the final uh, in our series. We are going to have an opportunity for all of our guest writers to come together um, uh, next week, next Thursday. So all there'll be all four of them and myself in a, in a conversation. And I hope somebody asks me a question too by then. You know, so <laughs> um, anyway, so tonight, uh, again, is Cristina Rivera Garza, and um, I will do, you'll get a chance to talk to her in a minute. I'm going to do her bio, and she is a recipient of MacArthur Foundation Fellowship in 2020. She's a distinguished professor in the University of Houston's Department of Hispanic Studies and leads its graduate Spanish language PhD program with a creative writing concentration. She's originally from Matamoros, Tamaulipas, on the northeast border with the United States, and has been a resident of the U.S. for many de for two decades. Rivera Garza is a prol prolific writer of fiction and critical essays, including nearly, nearly 20 works in Spanish, two of which garnered her the prestigious Sor Juana Ginez de la Cruz Prize, awarded internationally for a book written in Spanish by a female author. Many of Rivera Garza's works have been translated into English, including the book that we are really talking about today, um, Grieving. Um, and it's an especially timely reflection um, uh, right now for a U.S. readership. Uh, Rivera Garza most recently published a second book, Autobiografia del Algodón, in 2020, the autobiography of Cotton, a novel of her homeland inspired by her abuelo's history in the region. 2020 also saw the translation of Restless Dead, Necro Writing, and Disappropriation. And as I understand it, soon um, coming to the United States will be a final book, um, El Invent, not final in her life, but a final <laughs> year for the year, El Vencible Verano de Liliana, um, which is a book written about uh, the femicide of her own sister. And I, I look forward for a moment that we can talk about this. Um, it's kind of, I think, where I, I, want, I want to say, too, that we do have chat, so please feel free to write your comments in chat. And if you really have a question for Christina, uh, say, this is a question for Christina, so we can pull that out. And if time allows, we'll be able to get to, we'll be able to, get to those questions. Um, I think to begin with, um, I guess I want to say that in, in coming to know your work, and when we were driving over today, I had admitted to you that I had been very ignorant about your work, that somehow, and I know largely for me, it's really about that the most of your work has been written in Spanish in the earlier years. And, um, and much of the work is really, we're talking about the, the first two decades of the 21st century, where your work is just, I mean, the, the, the volume of works that you've produced has been phenomenal. And much, and much of it is fiction in the early, early writings. And then suddenly now there's this nonfiction voice surfacing. Um, and, uh, and now these translations are happening like, <laughs> I mean, we're talking about like four publications as I was reading almost in the last two years, mm -hmm. you know? So partly I want to know, you know, I want to ask you, one, how you feel about all of it, because the MacArthur II, I'm sure, has given you sudden grand visibility in the United States and, and uh, felicidades, it's Thank quite you. an honor. Mm -hmm. um, but so how you feel about all of this sort of attention, um, but also the phenomenon of it. I mean, what do you, wh how do you see sort of where you're seeing yourself um, as a Mexican and U.S. based writer? Um, what do you make of that, mm -hmm. your place in that whole sort of landscape? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation. It's uh, I'm really delighted to be here, and I I I look forward to to this conversation with both of you. It's just wonderful. It's such an opportunity. So thank you again, and I'm always very happy to be um, back uh, on this campus. Uh, uh, I, I was telling you earlier that I taught briefly here at the University of uh, California, Santa Barbara, at least for a couple of summers. So in a, in a way, it's a little bit like home. So, so thank you again for that. And now, um, well, and especially because we're going to be talking about a book that has been um, in the making, it seems to me, uh, 
for for a long long time as uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later today it is a book that keeps on um, mutating uh, adding and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, pushing out some essays depending on on uh, um, the situation and the the presentness in which uh, uh, the book um, uh, what, what the book is actually looking for or is trying to articulate with. But well, your question was about the, um, the translations and, uh, and the book and um, what has been happening recently. And uh, this, is, this is really interesting because I can speak of that as, um, you know, what is happening to me as, a, as an individual, as a person living here. But I see this very much connected to, to the growth of our communities in the United States. So when I first came uh, here, when I, when I thought I was coming here some 25 years ago, um, it was hard for me to just find people who were doing what I was trying to do. I was um, enrolled in a PhD program uh, in history, but at the same time I was writing. Um, what um, gets to be called creative writing in the United States. Um, and what I've seen happening uh, over the years is that this tremendous growth of, um, um, of a writing community, people, writers writing in Spanish uh, from within the United States mm -hmm. and producing uh, you know, a good chunk of what gets to be called Latin American literature or literature from the Spanish-speaking world. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense because we live, after all, in the second largest Spanish-speaking country in the world, right? Well taken. And, yes. uh, and we are about, um, uh, if my memory is working well right now, there are, there are we are about 10, 11 million Spanish-English bilingual in this country. So the numbers are a clear indication that of the strength of our communities, of, um, of uh, the widely use of Spanish in this country. I don't believe that, uh, that Spanish is a foreign language here, especially in places like California or in Texas, but truly everywhere. Yes. We are pretty much everywhere, as, as, as you well know. So for a number of years, I was uh, working and teaching in the United States, uh, reading as much as I was able to, uh, the kind of literature that I've been interested in. So I was developing a dialogue with a section of US literature or literature produced in the United States in English. Uh, and I was writing about that uh, in my columns or my essays that were published in Spanish and in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So I was having a dialogue with people who were not aware I was having a dialogue with them. Mm -hmm. And so the translation now, it seems that what is, um, what is allowing me to say is that, hey, I've been paying <laughs> attention to you. Uh, a lot of my work, in fact, has been um, influenced um, or it's been reacting to uh, um, issues and interests and problems and uh, you know that that I've seen uh, developed in in uh, in these works um, uh, produced here in English in this country, and so I've been I've been um, very observant. I've been paying a lot of attention, and now finally it seems to me that I get the chance mm -hmm. to in fact say this is a dialogue, yes. right? So I can answer back. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been paying attention, so that's that's really good. And the other, um, this is this is this comes with translation, and it's a very interesting uh, thing that I was not prepared to, for. Uh, I've I've been writing in Spanish ever since I came here. I mean, most of I wrote in English most most of my academic work, but I continue working uh, in Spanish. Um, at the beginning, I thought that it was just natural, like I, I wasn't even, I didn't think I was making a decision, but of course I was making a decision. Mm. And uh, it was a decision uh, that was allowed because of, um, uh, because of the strength of our communities, because of, uh, um, because after all, Spanish has been, uh, is alive and well in this country, so I was able to do that. Uh, in these circumstances. 
but I, I wrote those, all those books in Spanish, there, there was very much influenced by English. It was, I was, after all, living in an English-speaking context. And so now that I've been, um, uh, that I've been looking and reading at um, uh, the translations of my own work, I have the very eerie sensation that they somehow are returning to the original language in which they were conceived, mm. Mm. even though they were not the language in which they were written. But both of them are, I think, um, structural to to the to the to the writing mm -hmm. uh, at different levels and and uh, with different characteristics, but somehow uh, translation here is like a, a coming back home process, and and I've I've been taken very much by that, and uh, kind of surprised, but at the same time understanding the complexity of um, of course my personal situation, but not only. Uh, as an individual writer, but an, a writer that is very much aware and very much, um, um, uh, you know, in contact with uh, a larger community here mm -hmm. in the United States. I mean, it is a phenomenon. I mean, it's a phenomenon. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's the. I mean, that's the thing is that you're not. Um, it, you're not alone in this. Uh, right? Of course. And it's yeah. been. And it's happening with other people. And it's been going on. But there have. Like you said, well, now you get to have a dialogue. Well, this is a case in point. Yeah, right? yeah. Definitely. Great. Yeah, yeah. This is good. So I want to, before I go any further, I have to say, I'm so sorry, Sally, I didn't introduce you. <laughs> I was so, uh, talking about Palestine, I have to admit, upsets me. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, this is Sally Adera Rodriguez. Forgive, um, forgive my tears, but um, anyway, um, <laughs> she's the co-director of Las Maestras Center with me. and. Um, Anyway, she'll be participating in our conversation as well. So, but don't me. No, um, yeah. Um, so, partly what what I when you were talking about being in dialogue, one of the things that I appreciated about grieving in particular, and I highly recommend this book, um, is that you talked to me. You spoke to me, uh, a Chicana reader. You know, and I think we want to. We're, we're going to talk more about this for us as a Chicana readership, right? Doing yeah. reading this and. It, and you were telling me about Mexico, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and, and there's a certain way, there's kind of a, um, so, and I do want to ask you to, to give us, you know, kind of a little, what you're talking about here, because you, you deal with some major, major concerns, okay? So you're talking what you refer to as, a, as it is a war, a war in Mexico. And you're talking, it's mostly focused in the last two decades, primarily. And so there's the war, you know, the war in Mexico, it's a civil war, it's a war on drugs, and it's not, and it's a, the government's war on drugs, it's a government-made war, it's a cartel-made war, all of this, right, all these layering. You also integrate very effectively the whole issue of femicide, yeah. you know, through this. So, and, and there's some language that you bring up, um, you know, over and over again, and, but one of the most kind of compelling things, and, and it, it has a different, and, and we'll talk more about this a little bit later on, but it has a different meaning, the visceralist state, yeah. right? So can you tell us what that means to you and also give us a little bit of then where you're talking about the Pontius Pilate syndrome of the presidencies, yeah. right? So yeah. the issue of betrayal, the word impunity, yeah. right, that you use, and, and that there's a certain, there's repeated language in this, you're driving home this message, and so, Again, it's a question of what is that landscape to you? Yeah, right? yeah. No. Let me see. There, there, there were many, many issues in, in your question. Oh, yes. uh, perhaps what I, I should start by saying that at the very start, this book was a series of essays that I was writing um, very much as a, as a, I was going to say a journalist, but not really as a journalist. As someone who was very concerned about what was happening, and someone who was given um, a forum in a, in a newspaper in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I began writing these columns, these weekly columns, I was living in Mexico, and then I, I, I came back to the United States. So it combined my experience in both countries, just crossing the border, uh, you know, from Mexico to the United States, from the United States into Mexico, and all the way back. And um, at the very beginning, I was just uh, uh, a concerned uh, woman, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what is happening. Uh, the world around me was uh, was just changing rapidly. There was much 
pain around. Uh, there was always someone who's, who was being hurt. There was someone dying. There was someone killing. There was um, just so much pain. Uh, and, I, and I've always believed that, that writing it's a, at its best is a, it's a way of uh, critical thinking. Writing is always uh, in connection with uh, you know, the, the places, the territories, the, the, the actions, um, whatever we are doing, right? And um, so I, I started to, to write about uh, contemporary situations, just trying to explain to myself what is going on in here. And eventually, a very young editor from uh, an independent press um, located in Oaxaca, uh, he asked me for, for this book. So in a way, this is a book that was created by the understanding and the interpretation, the interest of a reader, because mm -hmm. I didn't know I was actually writing a book. Mm -hmm. But I was, in yes. many ways, because yes. I was, as you said, I was constantly coming back to some specific issues. And the war, a misnamed war, a war that everybody was talking about uh, and that had acquired by then the name of the war on drugs was very much not only in our minds but, but was on our streets and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in our homes and in, in our bodies. And I came to understand obviously that this, is, this was not necessarily a war on drugs, it was a war um, on us. On, on the citizens of, of this country, on civil society, and on the civil population, and uh, and I tried. Obviously, I was uh, I was reading some political science, some sociology, just trying to understand these things. But at the same time, I was trying to pay attention to to what people were telling me, to what I heard on the streets, so what some friends were just mentioning at times with great hesitation in low voices, only in, in you know, personal places that they felt safe about. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, um, that's when, when, uh, when I, what I was reading about social suffering and pain came into, into place somehow. So what I understood was that even though there was much that we didn't say in public, or that didn't get to hear in, in public forums, that people were um, talking, expressing uh, their own critical views on what's happening through a very strategic use of the language of pain. Yes. And so the language of pain that could come um, you know, through the idioms of, of religion or science or just spirituality in general. But there was a way in which all the criticism against the sources of, of our misfortune were, were being phrased uh, with the help of this language. So I thought, this is something that, that I, I need to s explore further. There, there are some answers that I'm looking for right here. And obviously, I, I paid attention to the, um, the huge transformation uh, in the late uh, 20th century, this, uh, what we call the, neo the instauration of the neoliberal state, um, the very much, um, you know, after the, the signing, the, the free trade agreement, uh, uh, all the dispossession of lands, uh, uh, the massive push for migration northward, uh, you know, specifically working class people coming, you know, having been um, uh, just uh, expelled from, from their own places and, and their lands. And so there, there, there were all these huge economic forces that, that obviously um, are central to this whole dilemma. But at the same time, and, and this is something that I, I wanted to grasp, was that um, through the language of pain, there was the possibility of expressing what we were going through, but at the same time to, to expose um, um, a potency, a, a different way of looking at things, another mm -hmm. possibility, right? So as soon as, as uh, when, when we are in pain and when we are trying to express why we feel like that, it is in inescapable just to, to talk about what are the causes of that pain? 
what are the, the, the ultimate um, origins of that social suffering? And that's the critical aspect of this language that I think is so generative. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to me is the, is the, the, the resistance, the, the resilience, the, the, the a form of activism that, that I just felt compelled to, to, to emphasize because personally I needed that. Mm -hmm. So just to be able to get up and go through my life and, uh, and just to understand that there, there was some solidarity and companionship that we were all trying to figure out uh, what was going on. And, um, and then just trying to, to, to you know, create that sense of, uh, of solidarity. I think that's, that's extremely important. Well, there's a certain um, quality to you, right? I'm going to ask you to read something here. Um, there's, I mean, the, the, what's interesting to me is that your, your, cr your critique, you know, your, your critique of capitalism, your, I mean, it's like, it's, you know, what you just mentioned, neoliberalism, beginning with NAFTA onward, yeah. um, what happens to people as a, it's like a domino effect that has been tremendous, it, it's been so fast, just in the last, even the last 20, but 30 years, mm -hmm. even, we're looking at it. So you have the ability, which I find, you know, as, as I find rather in, incredibly moving, that you have the ability to talk about, to have an inbred critique and at the same time, use language in a way that is in and of itself visceral, right? That the yeah. language itself yeah. is this visceral. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted, I, this, there's a part here, um, let me see if I can find it quickly. Um, and this you wrote in English, I believe, right? Some sections so, yes, are, yes. Yeah, so we can hear, I, this is, I have it, so this is, um, let me see. And it, it'll go through, it's kind of a, it will go through, um, here and the, and you can kind of, it, it starts, it starts right here over the last several decades because okay. you're talking about, you know, it's kind of, and I think I really would like people to hear how you manage to, to layer in the critique in a language that remains very grounded and anyway, they'll, they'll hear it. So yeah, just, and and I'm just remembering that you asked me about the visceral estate, yes. and I I, yeah. I, I just well, we, failed we'll to mention there. that we'll, we'll get, get to there. that. Okay, yes. because it is the body. I mean, this is really going to be the. This is what we're talking about here. The body. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Over the last several decades, for the 20th century, we Mexicans have been forced to witness the reduction of the body to its most basic form, as a producer of capital through both the maquilas and other transnational companies. The bare body has emerged, too, when the narco and the state, the narco state, have used the unilateral and spectacular violence of torture against the population. Mouth gaping, hair standing on end, cold as statues, truly paralyzed, we have done the only thing we could do in the face of such horror, part our lips and mouth wordlessly. As Cavarero recalls, even Primo Levi argued that the most important witnesses, um, those who have returned alive from an encounter with horror, are usually incapable of articulating their experiences. I insist, this is horror and nothing but horror. This is why it exists. This is its very root. On the other, on the other end of the spectrum, however, lies suffering. And where there is suffering, there is voice. Those who suffer have faced or horror and come back. The language of pain allows those allow uh, allows those who suffer, those who acknowledge their suffering and share it with others, to articulate an inexpressible experience as an intrinsic criticism against the sources that made it possible in the first place. When everything fa falls silent, when the gravity of the facts far surpasses our understanding and even our imagination, then there it is, ready, open, stammering, injured, babbling, the language of pain, the pain we share with others. I suppose that's... Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. um, and you say, you pain me, I suffer with you, I grieve myself with you, we mourn us, right? We mourn us. So that, you know, there's a, um, I, th I think, you know, partly 
that's what I mean about that there is this relationship that even in the language itself, that you're talking about, you have the, you understand, you're talking about the critique about all these forms of oppression happening and the loss of Mexico. I mean, the loss of land in Mexico, the loss of language, the loss of people, the, la the movement of people. The, the, the collection of essays um, is on a certain level, a, a, you know, a, a, the horror story, yeah. right? And, you know, I, I say for myself, if we're going to Mexico, spent being there as a young woman in the early 80s, I mean, it was a different place, even yeah. that t period of time. That's not that long ago. And um, so in that, um, th this concept then, and I think too in Spanish, the que tiene ver con las entrañas, right? Yeah. The visceralist. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, I was once uh, doing some research in, uh, in an old archive of um, uh, an insane asylum an all insane asylum in, uh, in uh, Baja California. And uh, I got to read these letters that an inmate, they were called inmates back then, uh, was addressing to the governor of that place, of Baja California. And the senorita, senorita Araceli, was actually writing to the governor, letting him know what was happening with, um, with her body. She, she was ill, she was going to undergo some surgery, she was afraid of what might happen to her, she was afraid that she was going to die, and the ones that, if that happened, that, that she wanted to know what was going to happen to, to her remains. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was reading that, I was just, uh, I was just amazed that some, somehow, someone, a woman, uh, believed that whatever, whatever was happening to her body would be of interest mm. of someone in, in, in power. Mm. Like, I would have never thought about that. Well, and granted, she was in an insane asylum, so we have to take that into consideration. Uh, but just um, the kind of um, assumption that I think she was working with, that whatever happened to her body was of, she had to be of interest of this, to the state, to the represent, representative of the state, so that so that she was, saw this as a as a positive thing. Or she was she was. Because uh, I'm thinking about the the use of DNA and the, I mean like science as I mean in terms of the black community, the whole history of yeah. using the body right yes. and the, the remains yes without permission right. So you're not talking about that. You're talking about somebody who thought this would this would be a like an offering or the she did not an offering. No, mm -hmm. she was just trying to figure out she wanted to know what was gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And she thought, just by, by virtue of writing this letter, mm -hmm. that and that someone in the position of power, that a governor, had to give her an answer for mm -hmm. that. So in a way she was thinking that the state, you know, the bureaucracy as such, not only had to be aware of what was happening with her, but had to well, she, was she had the right to know. And she was ex expecting an answer, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So, so that was that was kind of like a wow. That's just that's that's so interesting. That's just something that I could have never imagined doing mm -hmm. myself. You know, whatever I never thought, or I was living in a in a context in which I was very much convinced that whatever happened to my body, that the state couldn't care less about what happened to my body. Mm -hmm. You know, if I was sick, you know, we, we know all the problems that we yes. are facing with the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. uh, that um, many of, uh, of the jobs that people have to go through, I mean, they, they, they are just risking their lives in order to, to be able to work. And much of uh, the phenomenon that we're looking, this, this tragedy of, uh, shouldn't be a tragedy, but it is, it has become one. This, uh, with migration, just trying to cross the border to find a job. I mean, all, all these kinds of things. So uh, what I was thinking then is that obviously this woman, the Senorita Raceli, had uh, in mind a very different relationship to, with and to the state. And uh, it was a state in, in that sense, is when I thought about the, using that word in Spanish, entrañas. Mm -hmm. Era un estado que tenía que importarle el estado de sus entrañas, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I was thinking about the early post-revolutionary era in which at least uh, in terms of the public discourse, uh, the state developed um, a, a series of, uh, of measures and laws uh, uh, in terms of public education and, and a public system of, of health care, which obviously uh, uh, 
people in, in more contemporary times have had not access to. And so I was thinking exactly what we are talking about when, we're, when we talk about extractive economies, when, when we talk about colonialism, when we talk about this violence, essentially we're talking about this radical disregard for, for our bodies. For body. mm -hmm. and, uh, and so a state that I might uh, once have described as this Estado Entrañable, just based on, on this letter by, by this Senorita Araceli, uh, was essentially now a state sin entrañas. And you know, sin entrañas in Spanish has this other connotation, right? It's a cruel state. It's, a, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's just a state with no human concern about its constituents, about specifically about people's material bodies, right? And so that's how, how I came about this estado sin entrañas, mm -hmm. which is very difficult to translate into English. Yes, and I think one of, I don't want to give it away completely because I think one of our uh, yeah. students is going to ask you specifically about the we, translation We'll get part to of that. that, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but in, uh, what, I was, what I was very much trying to emphasize there is that there is um, um, a break uh, when we talk about the, the, the advent of the neoliberal state, when we talk about uh, the increasing relevance of e extractive economies, we are talking about um, very concrete aspects of, uh, of how our bodies get to be treated, how our bodies get to be taken care of or not in this context. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to, to make that connection. You know, uh, I, I understood intellectually these huge uh, economic, political, social transformations. But I'm a writer, you know, I'm a novelist. I, I wanted that, that minutia. I wanted to, to see how that uh, was um, translated in our daily lives. And, uh, and essentially that's, that's why I was thinking about these um, uh, estados sin entrañas. Mm -hmm. And so now, of course, um, I've, if I were to be writing this book right now, perhaps my, my take on the state itself, either with entrañas or con entrañas, would be way more um, critical. But at that point, I was thinking that as, uh, as, um, as the state was just relinquishing a responsibility that had been inscribed in the Constitution of 1917. Mm. Uh, that's the Pon Poncio, Poncio Pilatos uh, image, right? Just uh, right. washing Wash his hands, hands and it. saying, like, oh, I, I don't care. That's your problem. You know, mm -hmm. you have to find a way to deal with that. Uh, so uh, I was thinking that a lot of the important mobilizations during the 20th century all throughout Latin America. In fact, what they were looking for, it was, yes, a, a, a critical stand against the state, but also um, the sense that many of these mobilizations, especially the ones led by women, were asking the state to do what the state was supposed to be doing for them, you know, taking care of the population at the most basic of levels. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we just saw disappearing drastically, you know, through the, the late 20th century. And now it's, a, it's just a massive crisis. I well, think. and now to the point where the body is actually, you know, uh, it's the mutilated and yeah. hung up and heads rolling and yeah. all of the, the all that, the, the, the grossness of all of it. I mean, it's like, that's what kind of struck me too about that, the, the choice of language even in English, you know, yeah. because it is so visceral, yeah. the, 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 the disregard for the body is so fundamentally visceral, right? Yeah. And so this is, the, the book is interesting to me in that way, in the essays, because they kind of move in and out of that, of that understanding, right? It's, it's like what makes something visceral is, is that it no longer matters, that the body now is of no consequence, yeah. you know, whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want, I think that, um, I wanted to look at, go pull a little bit out of this. Um, I want to get into the issues of the of the bodies and migration that we had talked about too, right? Because partly in this, in the shape of all of this that we're talking about, of course, that what it means is that then people are constantly being having to move. Everybody's leaving. You know, the people are leaving Mexico. But you also, there is a kind of relationship to, and I want to kind of get, kind of pull it out a little bit, you know, to offer. Um, one of, uh, one of the students' questions coming in that has to do with, um, uh, and this is Taylor, uh, Taylor Holmes, and she, she, 
It's interesting, too, because there is this way in which you're talking about, there's also mythology This kind of moves in and out of the book, I mean, referring to, to myth, and myth on two levels. And, and so I wanted, I wanted her to come in now and ask you this question about that. And then we're going to pull over it, because it's also something that you had been talking about with the, with the sirenas, number two. Okay. So. Oh, yes, and we this have is, to put on our yeah. thank you. We're, we're still, you know, we're not completely uh, high-tech, but we'll put it on. We're trying. <laughs> we're trying, yes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Taylor Holmes, and I am a student in Professor Chetty Moraga's Latinx Public Voices class at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, my question for you is that in the text, myth plays an important role in your examination of collective memory. In chapter 12, you discuss the myth of mermaids in the sun and moon lakes and their desiccation. Yet in another, you refer to the ostensibly false self-mythologizing of the drug lord Mayo Zambada, noting the importance of keeping the narco from mythologizing himself. My question to you is if mythologies can work to both preserve communal memory as well as distort that memory, how do we as writers use mythology to imagine a different world? Thank you so much for taking my question. I look forward to the interview. Yeah. Wow, what a wonderful question. It's a great question. I love it. I love it. And uh, because it makes me think, right? Um, yeah. I. Let me try the, the, the thing about the, the narcos, about the way in which they, they, they became such a good, um, um, uh, what is it, RP, PR people? You know, this, yeah, PR. Uh, PR, PR people, public relations, yeah, yes, public yes. relations yes, people, yes. right? Selling the, their story as, uh, as uh, the modern Robin Hoods, uh, protecting their communities, which was very much um, uh, uh, a hegemonic point of view, a narrative, a dominant narrative for a while, right before we started to, to face this tremendous, spectacular type of violence that gets described in, in the book. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I used that, uh, a very specific interview that this notorious drug lord gave to a very prestigious uh, journalist in Mexico. And, and I tried to analyze um, uh, how he was creating a public persona. Uh, a, a likable public persona, and uh, and I can understand why why it that that kind of um, that kind of publicity took root. I mean, after all, some of them, some of these people, in fact, and we know this for a fact, uh, uh, they belong to poor communities, and some of them uh, went back and, in fact, helped in in, in some areas. Um, uh, obviously, uh, the um, the, the kind of violence that, that came as a result of, of all that is, was not limited to those areas, but kind of got spread throughout the whole, the whole country. So it was, for me, it was very important just to, to very carefully analyze that discourse as, as what I saw it, mm -hmm. as, as just a publicity stunt. Uh, it, it seemed to me that, that they were the true heirs of the pre, of the, the dominant party back then. They were doing that job, you know, that, that kind of somehow kind of fake connection with, um, with, um, with the popular classes, so to speak, mm -hmm. although based in some sort of reality. I mean, these were people who came from these working class backgrounds, course, after all. Course, so, yeah. so you have to be very careful about how to take that discourse and how to uh, dismantle it little by little. I was very concerned at that point that um, there was this emerging literature, the narco literature, that became uh, you know, very popular, kind of glamorizing uh, the, the male hero, uh, this Robin Hood type. And, uh, and, and that, that made me very, very uneasy because I was, obviously paying attention to, to the violence and to the victims of the violence, and mm -hmm. they didn't get the same treatment. So I, uh, this was a way of, um, of, uh, of doing what I think writing uh, helps us do, which is to, to deal in great detail, very carefully and very critically, with what appears to be natural. Mm -hmm. So in a way, this is, a, this is an attempt at denaturalizing some, a kind of violence that uses as many um, 
strategies as, as it can in order to, to, to pretend it is, it is right there. It's been there forever and it will be there forever too. You know, that, that, that sensation that, that this is how the world works. And if any have, I have learned something writing uh, for all these many years is that writing tells us, no, that's not true. Whatever it is in front of you, it can be something else. It can be totally different because mm -hmm. we're using the imagination, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, um, a critical imagination in any case. So I wanted to, to use that in that specific case and as often as I, as I could. On the other hand, of course, there are uh, myths and, and, and legends and, uh, and just part of our oral histories that have been nourishing alternative ways of looking at the world and living in this world. And um, I, I was at, at that point, the piece that Taylor was mentioning is uh, something that I wrote in regards to a place in which I lived very close. I, I lived for a while very close to, mm -hmm. to this big um, sacred mountain, uh, El Volcán Nevado de Toluc. And uh, I spent there uh, some uh, very happy years with, with my family and my father and, and uh, at that point uh, with my sister too and um, just learning um, about the different uh, types of power uh, ascribed to, to this mountain and the kind of people that were living there, the, the communities of, of peasants mostly that, that lived there. So it was, I had a, a, a personal relationship to this territory as a sacred territory and I wanted to learn more about uh, you know other stories. And the stories of the mermaids are, are just amazing in this area. Um, because can you imagine? This is central Mexico. Is there is that, no is water. That, no, no. There is no ocean. <laughs> there, are, and I was thinking, just come on. Where are all these mermaids coming from? And how uh, how do they manage? How how, how come they uh, they have families? They have uh, male mermaids, sirenos, right, living here. And and it turns out, of course, that this is very much related to the to the relevance of of water. Mm -hmm. and the whole cycle of planting and harvesting and, uh, and just the uh, mountains are, uh, as, as you know, uh, they're the very representation of water, like glasses of water for, for the whole, uh, not only com specific communities, but for the land as such. And so I, um, I was writing a piece about um, water shortages and about the way in which most of this water in the area uh, uh, in, in, this, in the state of Mexico, close to Toluca, had been used and diverted for usage in Mexico City. And, uh, and that relationship, as obvious as it is, and, uh, is, is something that I don't think most dwellers of Mexico City see no. that clearly. And I think there is a connection, obviously. I mean, we are talking about extractive economies. We are not only talking about specific industries. We are talking about a whole philosophy, a, a whole view of our natural world. And, uh, and as, as we now know, you know, water is, now we, we have a price, right, for, for water. It's in the stock market, right? Mm. Uh, and so, uh, but there are these other enduring, um, really relevant ways in which all these resources are not only, they're not resources. You know, they are these, these entities, these, these uh, beings right there. Um, and, and mermaids came to me, uh, or I pay attention to them in any case, because of that, of that connection with water. Now, in terms of the writing, uh, I guess the, the answer is, is very much um, in, in what I just said, right? Uh, there is, I, when, when I think I'm writing is when, when, uh, when all my, my critical, strategies are at work. So we can all tell stories and we use stories for a number of, uh, of reasons. We make ourselves through stories. We are social beings, right? Um, so you don't need to be a writer to tell stories. That's what I'm, I'm trying to say. We all tell stories. Mm -hmm. but, when, but when we are writing, to me, is that when um, there, is a, there is a responsibility about, um, about um, bringing many stories, other people's stories, uh, other entities' stories, uh, and thinking critically about what do we do with them? How come 
uh, how am I going to be inviting them from where they are, where they are experienced, into page or onto screen, right? So just thinking about that, you know, how come I'm writing these? Why am I paying attention to these? What kind of connections and vector and forces are inciting or are, or are at work in these very specific, seemingly irrelevant phenomena, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's when I think I'm writing. So that's, it's not only the story that I'm telling, but I'm looking at each one of these little elements um, uh, or big elements or aspects. Uh, and in this case, um, I, I wanted to use that, that kind of scalpel, that kind of critical view on the one hand to dismantle a myth in the making, that hegemonic view of these violent entrepreneurs of our contemporary times, uh, estos empresarios, no, mm -hmm. este, de, de la muerte. Um, and on the other hand, uh, to, to be reminded of the enduring legacy of these other ways of looking at and being in the world. Exactly. Well, and they, they even as, after the water dried up, they still continue to yeah. offer ofrendas to that. To yeah, that. Yes. absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It's still, uh, it's still a, um, a, a when, when, when there is a, a peregrination, 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 pilgrimage, exactly, yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, yeah, it's, it's still a very much a sacred place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sally, did you want to? Talk oh, a little bit about yes. the mythology stuff. I can feel your I know, yeah, I know. I can feel your I, energy I, I, there. <laughs> well, I have to say that, you know, the, when I hit the part of the book where you described a dream that I'd had, like I wanted to know where was this place because I dreamed this place so viscerally and I dreamed this place and then I I, I read it. I think it's um now I'm gonna mis mispronounce it, but we'll get to it later. Okay, okay. Well, I think what struck me about it was, you know, I was just right now thinking about uh, Colleen Sisk, who's the chief of the Winnemum Wintu up north in Mount Shasta. And uh, they have a tradition, they're in Mount Shasta, they have uh, you know, stories of water, and she's also very knowledgeable about the way water is held. And of course, you know, there's the plant, uh, you know, the, the corporation sucking the water yeah. out, yeah. you know, which yeah. basically, you know, she's you know, talking about how much water is there and how long it's been there, those primordial waters. Yeah. But she always has, has said, like her grandmother, uh, Flora Jones, always, or Florence Jones, excuse me, always spoke to the fact that water is sacred, that statement. But it had meaning in the sense that she always said water, or he says water is not a resource, water yeah. is sacred, and water has a spirit. Yeah. So when I read that, I thought, well, this is a representation of the spirits. And so, of course, the people would keep praying to the spirits because the, 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 the real issue is if we stop praying to those spirits, if we stop acknowledging their life, you know, what happens to our connection? And does that connection die? And if the spirit dies, then we're totally lost as human beings because, you know, we are water. And so that, that aspect of it, you know, really, really struck me, you know, mm -hmm. and to see that, that as I was translating for... Um, Carmita, who is from um, Ecuador, mm -hmm. she was visiting up with the Winnemum and Kaleen, mm -hmm. and they were talking uh, about the meeting of mountains, about, of course, you know, the mountains meet, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they meet at the feet, mm -hmm. and that water that moves between them. So it just was so revealing that, because I had no knowledge of these mermaids, and I thought, mm -hmm. well, they are the spirits of the water, the way they're represented there. And they represent then the, the bigger picture that we don't have in our own heads because we you know, are now so separated from water. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the woman, Shiva, the person from India who speaks on water. Um, oh, her name just went out of my head. Um, she said our loss of democracy is the loss of our connection to water, yeah. that we no longer know where our water comes from. We no longer have control over our water. And that has really stayed with me, you know, um, all this time really thinking about that. And, and also, um, well, there was so much, you know, when you were speaking about, uh, you know, this, this um, the nafta and the narcotrafico y todo eso. For me, it always has represented, you know, the, that 
those children that are fleeing that yeah. you speak of, yeah. this is what they're fleeing. Not only the narcos, but also the occupation of their lands of and the course. environmental degradation of their lands. And somehow the connection is never made. You know, mm -hmm. that, that the roads that have been built through um, NAFTA have erased, you know, the old roads that, that proliferated and that held whole communities alive, mm -hmm. that kept, you know, the agriculture, exactly. that kept the artisans. And, and those things, as you were saying, you know, all came from stories, from people talking about this, what was lost. You mm -hmm. know, I was again remembering a, um, uh, it's the, um, well, I'm going to forget, how can I forget her <laughs> name? Our friend that came from the, was in, that was in sanctuary. I have oh, Flor, 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 Flor Christos, 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 Christos. Okay. I had all my Flores and Flores and Florences <laughs> mixed up, but um, I, as you were speaking uh, in your book, you know, I was remembering that Flor was also in, in Sanctuary in Chicago. The mm -hmm. same place, Alberto, Albe, yeah. Alberto. Alberto, Alberto, the same church where um, Elvida Arellano was. Okay, uh -huh. okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. who, you, who you speak of. She yeah. followed her, mm -hmm. was, was right after there. And, and, but <laughs> fierce sister. Fierce, you know, and uh, and Flora began to speak immediately about NAFTA, yeah. which nobody knew what to do with. And, uh, you know, really, because, you know, she did not speak about, you know, she spoke about the loss of her children, but she put it in her face and says, you don't care about my children because they're not American born. They're over there. You can't see them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. And meanwhile, you know, those children basically spent about 15 years without her. Wow. Well, yeah. And so her so concern. This is the, I mean, ironically, it's also the separation of children. Before they start talking to, from their parents, before they start talking about the separation of children from their parents on the border, because it's the other. I mean, that the the parents it's are here side. and the children yeah, are yes, left. You yes. know. Yeah. So the mito, you know, opened up the the the, the mito of the land, right? The mito that becomes the folk tale, mm -hmm. that becomes the people's story. Mm -hmm. That becomes the theory. That's what mm -hmm. I saw you're you, mm -hmm. you doing in this, and mm -hmm. and so I was mm -hmm. so grateful to you for interrupting the NAFTA. <laughs> I mean, excuse me, the the cartel mito, yeah. which maybe is more connected to the diablo. I don't know. You know, <laughs> like my mom said, "Anda el diablo es vuelto en este mundo." <laughs> it could be. You know, of course. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think too the thing that in that same section too soon after you also begin to talk about, and this is something that has been very strong. I mean, I feel like in my own writing for many years is the, the idea of, you know, that of turning backwards in order to go forward, mm -hmm. you know, and that this is a, and so it is, it is in those stories, is in, the, in those mythologies, et cetera, that, that one returns, right? And in that return, then they have resonance for where we yeah. need to go now. So I felt like the, the Serena moment was very much about that. Um, and that is, you know, and I, I think you also want to talk about this whole thing about um, all of the, about the road, the image of the road, you know, and you're talking about migration. So it's both talking about bodies in migration, and then later you talk about riding in migration, yeah. right? Or, or they're, they're connected, of course. So um, one thing, when Sally, we have these conversations, you know, I feel like some are very fortunate to be able to talk back and forth to each other, because por eso no estamos tan locas. And then, and, um, but one thing that came up to me, and Sally had this line, and, and so I'm kind of cheating a little bit by, by telling the line, but we were talking about, so what is the, re it was all of the migration stories going on, and I mean, the, the, the the forced migration that's happening, this incredible loss, and at the same time also this sense about of a certain sort of homelessness for those of us, for, for people that are here, in the sense of, and what the word you had used, which really struck me, was Chicanos are the road. And I was curious about sort of the connection you were making with that. Well, it's because once we're extracted, you know, I think you, you touched on it, you know, and saying that, you know, we are all Native peoples. We have, we have had connection to that land. Not so long ago, some of us, but really not so long ago when mm -hmm. you think about the time. Yeah. You know, and yet, you know, once we're extracted, we're not allowed to, to root. We're not allowed to connect ourselves. You know, it's constant excavation of us in the imagination. Here in the United States, as you said, you know, we're such a Spanish-speaking, you know, <laughs> huge, huge 
mm -hmm. know, and yet that's not known. That's not common. That's yeah. not that's not common among the book publishers, for instance, who keep saying there's no readership. Sure. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I I was you know, I I thought about it us as the road, and so in reading your work, you know, as you were saying all this movement, and and I was making that connection because I felt that since we're not allowed to to be to root ourselves in any place exactly, you know, we're always reminded this is not your place of origin. You know, mm -hmm. and then I, I, I thought that perhaps, you know, where we live is the road that is our place. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, uh, I've been thinking a lot, of, obviously, about these, these issues. I, um, uh, I think it's really interesting that the piece on migration is something that I did with, uh, very, in very close connection with, um, with Lina Meruane yes, and this book see, about yes, Palestine. Right, and then you exactly. began this conversation, yes. reminded us of the horror that is taking place right now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and Lina's work allowed me to, to really think about her own experience, uh, but also to, to fuse there, to bring into the threads of my own uh, uh, story, my own history. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you are very right. I, uh, there is this sensation, um, let me put it in, in, in very personal terms. I, I've been living in this country for many, many years, uh, it's, it's more than 20, and it hasn't been, and even though I knew I had uh, uh, some information and rumors and family stories about the histories of my of my grandparents as people who actually crossed the border in the very early 20th century and and grew up in the United States and uh, uh, you know they worked here in the cotton fields in 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 Texas uh, in the cities like Houston and then they were um, uh, deported. Uh, uh, pushed out. Uh, and so I knew this, I had a sense of this story. Uh, but when I first came here, uh, I, I didn't have um, a clear connection to that story. And so I thought I was arriving. Uh, mm -hmm. Now that I think in the long term of, of this story encompassing generations, I know I was not arriving. I was coming back. You're returning. Yeah, I was returning. You're returning. Exactly, yeah. and just uh, learning to see this, this my personal experience into this in this longer span of time, and encompassing these generations, has allowed me to think of of that. Well, my roots are here, of course. You know, I ascribe uh, uh, work uh, a great deal of uh, of importance. You know, we we own what we work on. And so uh, in, in, in the more recent book, in Autobiography of Cotton, uh, I very much end up, well, I don't want to give out the story, but uh, a good, uh, 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 an important book. <laughs> <laughs> Still in Spanish, will be in English, but w one important point there, at least in, in my own process of thinking about um, roots and about that road and about belonging uh, has to do with this idea that uh, for a number of years, I thought I was visiting. When well, no, I mean this this country had uh, my grandparents had worked here, and in many ways had um, given it to me. Uh, so I needed to think about that kind of like a permission, like that kind of legitimization, uh, legitimacy in a way mm -hmm. to that experience. Uh, but it had to come from a, from a, from a story, a family story. And, and now that I think about that coming back, about that return, it's like, yeah, it's in that, in that movement, in that constant going back and forth. That's the belonging. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's what I, I, I have to keep thinking about. In What's a way, that? I think no. grieving was, was the beginning of that reflection, hmm. which has developed in some more recent books. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I look forward to those too. <laughs> but I mean, I think it is on a certain level um, that it's. I, I remember we were talking about the, in, when you're talking about um, about the, the the us being isolated because of the coronavirus, right? And so doing everything basically on mm -hmm. you know internet and all that. And then you say, well, you you get tired, so much more tired doing that because your body knows you really didn't see those people, yeah. right? And so that's what the border seems like to me. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like because yeah, the yeah. body knows 
they don't re the body doesn't recognize border of you know course. nation state it yes. does not you know the animals it's, across don't recognize yeah. it we have bodies too you know yeah. so when you were saying that i say it reminds me of what you were saying about us being in isolation and <laughs> being online yeah and it and it you know it's kind of a, a be, and then also, th you talk about this also in relation to language, and there's some beautiful, this part, I have to say, this is one of my favorite parts. There is, of course, it's about language and writing and migration. There is, of course, the backbone of Spanish, but at its side, and I also want, want to just kind of insert here that you, you talk about Spanish with recognition that Spanish is a colonial language, yeah. like English is a colonial language. But in this country, it is a second-class citizen. Yeah. You know, in this clan, it's the language of the oppressed yeah. in the United States. So I just want to say that first. <laughs> and that, you know, because that sometimes is an obvious thing that we don't, we don't really just put out and then we can go on. But there is, of course, the backbone of Spanish, but at its side, in porous layers, mm -hmm. also stretch those other languages, that of the migrations placed and blurred mm -hmm. along the way that which refuses to die, that rhythm I do not control and notice even less is the genetic charge of the sound of sound in migration. Mm. And then, there's an, another line you had here, so I can see, then you say, remembering languages, right? Is it pre-colonial, decolonized memory bank? What is this, right? But they also spoke something else yeah. when you were talking about your relations, right? You know, not Spanish, they, they know Spanish. They also spoke something of another tongue, the one they stopped using, the one their children did not inherit, the one that will always be a matter of speculation. Mm -hmm. right? And so, of course, I mean, I feel that so much, so much about us that have been, you know, in, and, and because the border doesn't really, if it doesn't really mean anything, you know, then all of us are moving, but somehow are at once at home. You know, but but we're we're not taught. We don't. We are led the master narrative. Is that we're never home. Yeah. You know. So mm -hmm. this is the. I mean, and you, beautiful, beautiful sections in there. And you know, so um, I want to. If if I can, right, I want to transfer over to to um, talking with uh, Maria, uh, who is from Colombia, who has uh, some, some really really important questions in this regard about about Colombia and about translation and about language. And um, so let me put my earphones on this time. I'll remember yeah, to do it. Let me see. Let me see. And um, oui. let me just. So uh, this is Maria Cintura. And um, she has two questions for you okay. that will resonate with what we're speaking of here. Hola, Cristina. My name is Maria Carolina Cintura. I am a graduate student in the Department of English at UCSB. First, I wanna thank you for sharing this space with us and for entertaining my questions. I have two of these for you. First, um, I had the opportunity of consulting the first and second editions of Dolerse and its recent translation to English, Grieving, and they each feel like quite distinct books. Especially the English version felt to me more like an adaptation than a translation, which brought me back to the prologue of the second edition of Dolerse, where you describe the book as una conversación, una visita, una insistencia. And I wonder if these three versions, perhaps in responding to three different moments, are enacting a conversation with different readerships. If maybe the readers are being visited not only in different moments and different languages, but also in different places and contexts in the world. In brief, my first question is asking whether the conversation in English is different than the conversation in Spanish beyond the mere fact of language and what the experience um, of having this particular text translated into English is like. My second question has to do with the place and context in which this book is visiting me. I am a Colombian currently based in Colombia where people are right now, as we speak, massively mobilizing and protesting. We have been doing so for the past 20 days. Um, to use your very powerful language, we protest against a visceralist state and a government that in treating governance as a mere matter of administration of property and protection of the wealth of the wealthy has enacted all sorts of violence against protesters and against the people um, through homicidal police violence, 
through stigmatizing social movements, through neglect and incompetence and arrogance and elitism. So I guess I'm asking for a message for my people. How do we enact or recover una relación entrañable, a visceral and careful relationship to one another and to our nation? Gracias. Wow. Those are really important questions. Thank you so much for, for asking them. Um, Wow, what a, what a privilege to be, be read in, in such a way with, well, with that detail. Thank you so amazing. much again no, for, for the, the opportunity. Been amazing. No, this, <laughs> is, this is really, really interesting. Well, let me see um, about... Uh, there are, in fact, yes, two editions of this book in Spanish, and, and they are very different one uh, from the other. I, um, we published the first one... <clears throat> Don't let me lie. It was, I guess, 2010 or 11, and then the second one a couple of years. And 2015, something like something that. Something like that. Yeah, 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 there are a couple of years of difference between yeah. the first and the yeah. second one, and um, you know, I can say yes, uh, context and uh, the possibility of this book to articulate with the present played a role in terms of the selection of the pieces, mm -hmm. but I also have to say that I was learning, and that I rewrote some pieces that I, uh, just as we were doing earlier with, right, you know, yeah. just editing said, at the oh, last editing. moment. <laughs> 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 yeah, I do that all the time. So, um, for example, there was one piece in the, in the first edition about um, Luz Maria Davila, the woman from Ciudad Juarez who had lost uh, her two um, boys to, in this, uh, the Salvarca massacre of 2010. And I had written a piece about that uh, I was obviously very shocked and very moved, and I wanted to convey to the public uh, uh, Luz Maria Davila's resilience and strength. Uh, and but then, when I read that piece, uh, I realized that that I was that it, uh, that I needed to do something else. That I I needed to use some different writing strategies to provide. Luz Maria's voice with, with the space in the book that she deserved. I thought that I was in, just interrupting her too much mm. and that, uh, that it was not my place to do so. That my, my place as a writer right there was just to, to, to generate a context so that, that her voice, which was powerful and, 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 and beautiful in, in many ways too. So I just wanted to, to, to Take this, the the the, play, the space here in the book and just allow that voice to just to evolve and to and to bloom, so to speak. And so I changed that. I, I totally rewrote it for for the second edition. So if you've written, uh, if you read the second edition, I mean that that the was second edition in, in Spanish, Spanish in uh -huh, Spanish. Uh -huh. So for example, so I I decided to to uh, include different, some new essays that I was writing. I decided to delete some other ones. And, and once, like, like this one about, about Luz Maria Davila, I decided that, that I, I needed to work on that one. I, I just mm. di I w didn't want to let it go like that. So I, I rewrote it for the second edition. And then when we were approaching the, the translation, um, well, translation is a collaborative work. And, uh, mm -hmm. and very much, I think of that as a, as a process of co-authorship. So Sara, Sara Booker, uh, whose work I really admire, she's a very young, very talented, incredibly, uh, with great initiative, and, and just a delight to work with. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we were working on each one of these pieces, and, uh, and then uh, I've been writing some uh, new ones on you know, in the pandemic or I was uh, I was writing on um, on Ciudad Juarez but but as it is right now mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the piece that I wrote uh, about Luz Maria Davila in 2010 and so yes on the one hand it, it was a matter of uh, updating the book uh, mm -hmm. it was a matter of um, just uh, keep it um, current with, with whatever we were facing, but it was way more than that. So, um, as I've said, uh, I, I was happy that the book uh, 
had found uh, its way into second edition and then into the translation in English. And at the same time, I was very sad because, you know, if, we, if this book is still necessary, that means that the situation is getting worse and worse. And um, so I, I wish I didn't have to write these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the, the world would have been, would have to be different. Uh, but it is not, and, and as we all know, I think we're facing uh, increasing challenges uh, by very powerful uh, forces in our worlds, and so we have to, to be on our toes, and I think writing helps us to do that. So for, for this English um, edition, I was, uh, we, were, we were very aware that the book was going to be crossing borders, and uh, in this um, newly revealed conversation, that I knew I was having with, uh, with uh, English-speaking uh, peoples from this country, mm -hmm. uh, when now they were going to be learning about my co the conversation that I had been maintaining with them, I wanted to, to <laughs> alert them about you know, the context in which this took place for me in any case. And uh, um, I guess, obviously, too, I've been writing more and more about uh, um, you know, migration and my relationship to the United States, uh, um, something that, that I took um, at the very beginning kind of like for granted, the fact that I continue writing in Spanish had become a, a, a source of all sorts of um, um, critical uh, thought. Right, something that I needed to to explain to myself why I was doing that, what allowed me to do that, what kind of um, 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 conditions in terms of the Mexican and Mexican American communities in the United States allowed me to to, mm -hmm. to make those decisions as though they were just natural decisions, mm -hmm. uh, and so there was a lot of um, a lot of responsibility, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And I was very willing, yeah, to, to, to say, yeah, I have to own that and I have to go through, through all that process. And so we decided to add uh, more recent essays. Um, uh, I have been writing more and more about uh, women's movements, um, specifically in Mexico, but, but in fact, I, I've been paying a lot of attention to um, a range of feminisms, both from within the United States and throughout the Spanish-speaking world. And so all of that came, uh, it just, uh, we, we decided to incorporate that into the English version. And the pieces like the one that I wrote um, with Lina Mervanes' book was just a, kind of like, a, well, of course it has to be there. Oh, yes. there's, a, there's that uh, very, Lina Mervanes' work, I, I really admire her. I, I, I really think that she's a powerful thinker, a wonderful writer. And, uh, and so just sharing those uh, migrating stories in, in, on page, that was very important to me too. And, and just honoring the fact that there are more and more writers, um, you know, writing in Spanish, at times in English too, you know, from within the United States and, and developing these, which to me is a very important conversation with, um, with, um, with Spanish speakers um, abroad, right. outside of the United States. Yeah. So and then there was second another. question there was, was, what do you have to say about Colombia? Well, what I have to say about Colombia is that I've learned a lot uh, from thinkers and activists from Colombia when I was writing this book. I think um, uh, the many years of uh, a, a war that Colombia has gone through had, uh, uh, has um, um, generated a, a very important uh, theory and um, thought and, and uh, just ideas about how to deal with, with the situation that, that, that I faced when I was in Mexico, right? So that, that would be my, my first take on that. So um, on the other hand, but can I can you say specifically what that is? Yeah, for example, uh, I, uh, I remember having uh, being um, reading and, and of course, the, the name of the author is going to escape, is going to escape me right <laughs> okay, now. Okay, we can all just share yes, that. Yes, of course. <laughs> but the idea about um, uh, emotional communities, you know, transnational emotional communities mm. and how we participate on those and the way in which we can contribute uh, in different ways through writing, through activism, and, and 
both sides of, and the many sides of many borders. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I learned from uh, an anthropologist from Colombia, for example. And then the, the um, old um, writings and, and mobilizations uh, against violence also in Colombia, narco-related violence, I think it has just uh, taught me many, many things. So I, that's what I'm thinking of when, I, when I'm saying that. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, and on the other hand, of course, I've been um, following the news. I, I've um, uh, I've been paying attention to what is happening in Colombia as well as what is happening in Chile these days. Yes, and yes. Uh, and so I, as much as I am uh, concern, obviously, about these whole situations is, to me, it's always, it's amazing um, how the solidarity and the, the resilience and the willingness to risk everything for what is right, uh, uh, calling for justice and uh, uh, just going there and taking over public space and speaking their truth, I think that's, that is just so powerful and, and it makes me feel optimistic in spite of uh, uh, how horrible the conditions are. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess the reasons why I decided that, that uh, it would be a good idea to publish Grieving also in English is because I think we have to a lot to learn from this language of pain. It seems to me that we live in a country that is very averse to pain. Mm. And in general, uh, the, this idea that time just goes by and then we, then we age, and then we become uh, fragile and more dependent on others. And uh, just this whole idea that the individual is not self-sufficient and, uh, uh, and that we need others, in fact, and that we, uh, we need care and we can provide care and that we can, we can create this caring communities, I think, is, is incredibly important. Uh, and so when, I, when I'm saying that it is important to, to continue speaking about pain, it's not in the sense of turning ourselves into passive victims of fatalistic uh, you know, entities in whatever we're going through, but just as a, as, a, as a way, one of the many ways that we might have to actually identify those sources of, of pain, of our right. misfortune, and act critically about that. So in regards to that, if you're, if you're asking me, like, what can we do? Well, what you are doing is, is, is incredibly important to organizing, um, um, putting our bodies out there that there should be. Uh, but all in all, I think it's, really, it's also really important to keep speaking our pain out. To, to not to avoid that because it's, um, let me see. I do believe that when we speak about our pain, we are talking about our bodies, even if our pain is spiritual, mm -hmm. and it, even if it translates into some kind of spiritual malaise, uh, it always goes back to our um, materiality, to our bodies. And our bodies are both uh, this, this physical entity that is in here, but also, I mean, all our myths, or our, all our histories, all our, um, our ancestors, or all, all this spiritual realm that is so relevant. So it seems to me that this language of pain helps us, or help, has helped me in any case, transfer, transverse those realms. And that's, um, I see some political power in that. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that, yes. Did you, would you want to say more about that? I mean, about the migration thing, I was going to comment, or do you? No, I just wanted to say that um, uh, you remind me uh, in, the, in the book of pain, and I can't help but think of Maledoma Somme, who, who talks about ritual and healing and community, mm -hmm. and he talks about pain being important. Like, you know, we need to recognize our pain and honor it because it tells us that something is wrong. Yeah. yeah. And he also speaks of it because he speaks of the... Of what is happening to our communities. You know, he's speaking of his own community, an indigenous community, that in, in, in having to deal with the nation state, 
becoming wage earners, mm -hmm. but the ceremonial rounds, the ceremonial ritual rounds go missing. And it's those activities that actually attune themselves to that pain. That that's what that's what they try to heal. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's the body, the spirit, but also within the social realm, oh, within the community. Yeah. And that's the part that maybe those those the the, the ceremony of protest, you know that mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. the healing right. aspect of it. Even though, you know, it is so dangerous, and I don't take it lightly that yeah. that that what they do. You know, as we watch Palestinians, you know, continue to resist, yeah. even though it means what it means in terms of the suffering that's caused. So I really appreciated your speaking to pain because it's true that, you know, we tend to hear we anesthetize it, and then we have also our trigger warnings. You know, where we we have to be warned because we have to prepare ourselves. You know, not to be shocked by. It. And I understand that. You know, I understand that, but. I don't know. There's also this this place in which, uh, you know, we're supposed to feel. There's something, you know, that that as he was saying, we're supposed to feel. As you're saying, we're supposed to feel. It's supposed to motivate us, move us, cause us to investigate, you know, cause us to want to in healing, mm -hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I always think about that Tony K. Bambara statement, you know, and can you afford in Salt Eaters, and then mm -hmm. her novel Salt Eaters, can you afford to be well? Yeah. You know, and that, you know, yeah. so much of what, you know, when you're talking about the United States and the, the denial of the body, I mean, that's like the fundamental, we know like the fundamental split from the, the East and the West, I mean, the Western thought, which is they're not connected, that your body is not, somehow not connected, you know, to your, to your mind, that there's mm -hmm. a separation. That's kind of the most fundamental split, and, and that, you know, it just seems that this, this level of the ridiculous, you know, that the world has gotten to such a point. The mm -hmm. thing about those mass protests, too, is that there is a tremendous, I always think about, you know, solidaridad, yeah. what that means. Mm -hmm. And what happens to you that when that we erupts in you, you know, yeah. that you're willing to do something that you would, I mean, turn physical, you know, like physical danger and all that, becomes, looks different in a we than the I. And that's what's so, um, you know, it, it, th that's what the United States constantly asking us to do is to just be individuals, to be individuals, to be just, the future is the future. You don't look back, you just look at the future. Um, so these are, you know, the, I, I feel like, you know, what also what Maria is bringing up too that I feel is that it does feel to me, and I'm wondering, am I just being, you know, naive, but it does feel global. It does yeah. feel that these, that this really, I mean, these confrontations are happening yeah. now everywhere. You know, and and I think with the also, I think in, integral to that is is our question about the planet. You know, of course. that that is that's in, that's the body. That's the exactly. body. You know, yes. we mm -hmm. are animals. The yeah. animal is there. You know, mm -hmm. that there that that separation no longer works either. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. I think that there and and what's interesting to me sometimes is that the language can be quite lofty in the university about these concepts. And yet, most people know it. I mean, like when you're talking to regular, I mean, most people know that there's something really, really wrong about, you know, a whole system in, in this country of drugs so you don't feel, you know? So whatever problem you have, you know, you love those commercials where they say, this is going to be the drug to save your life, and then they have all the list of, but it's going to give you this, yeah, this, this. Yeah, in and very just, small letters. Yeah, in very small yeah, letters, you yeah, know, well, the cure yeah. will kill you. Each yeah, time, the yeah. cure will kill you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I want I, there's we, we have several uh, a couple of things I want to make sure that we do talk about in our time and also we do have some interesting questions in okay. chat mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, we've prepared a little a little closing the two of us so you know we want to get to do that our little choreographed moment um, but one thing I did two things in particular I do want you to talk about. Um, the feminism issue that you were bringing, the feminisms, right? And particularly about Mexican feminism and what you're seeing going on now, which seems dis very distinct from what I encountered many years ago as a young feminist in Mexico, you know, in terms of the feminist movement was there. This one feels much more popular. Tell me, tell me a bit of, about what oh, you encountered. Oh, you don't want to hear me. <laughs> <laughs> It's it just, you know, it was very, I mean, I think it always, and I always remember Ana Castillo's line, you know, is that, that we are the, we are the daughters of your, of your um, criadas, mm. of your maids, mm. right? Mm. And that really does typify it because you, we come in and 
So we're, we're U.S. citizens. We come to Mexico. We, do, we are first-generation writers. We come in, and, and, we, and, and we're coming out of a woman of color movement here in the United States, right? So this is in the early 80s, right mm -hmm. after this bridge called my back. I go to Mexico. People are, you know, nice. It was nice women, you know. But I thought, oh, my God. It was like, that was just the white women's movement that I spent, you know, the 70s getting out of, you know, like that, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, the class distinctions yeah. and, you know, and really, um, and also that they were looking to Europe for their, to understand their feminism. When we were right there, like we were, you know, it was only Elena Tandutaska who was the first one to kind of open that up that maybe you might want to listen to mm -hmm. what some of these Chicana feminists were saying, you know, mm -hmm. about, you know, mm -hmm. women of color feminism. So... But, but it is different. Things have really, really changed, and particularly around the activism and femicide, you know, in the femicide movement, anti-femicide movement. So I wanted you to talk a little bit yeah. about that. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, thank you for sharing that. Uh, uh, that gives, gives us context, look, When too. we go out for dinner, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> More. The juicy details. Yeah. Um, well, we would have to remember that there is a long tradition of feminism in Mexico, and, and that usually comes as a surprise for many. So the first um, uh, feminist congress in Mexico took place in 1916 uh, by uh, Elvira Carrillo Puerto, mm -hmm. who's the one who organized that. So for, for people who believe that, that feminism was born like yesterday in Mexico, yeah. well, I have some news. <laughs> this, is, this is very much part of our traditions, uh, and, and it's a long tradition at that, right? Um, what I what is happening? Uh, uh, it's uh, well, what 20, 30 more years of impunity, I think, of uh, increasing numbers of femicide that um, never meet the work of justice, mm -hmm. and uh, increasing sense of um, uh, um, uh, lack of security, especially in public spaces, but not only there. Uh, in uh, workplaces and even in, in, in families and, and within the domestic arena, right? So we have entire generations of young women who've never felt safe wherever they are, mm -hmm. whether at home or outside, in the classrooms, in the factories, uh, in their offices, on the street. All classes. Uh, pretty much everybody. And, it's, and it seems to me that they are uh, rightfully enraged. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we see now, it's a very active, very powerful, very energetic uh, group of uh, mostly young women, uh, um, I think very rightfully criticizing the, the neglect of the state in terms of uh, what they've done uh, with femicide specifically. And uh, young women who've been um, uh, sharing ideas, not only, uh, you know, whose ideas come from their own activism. So it's very, a very hands-on kind of movement in a context in which we are paying increasing attention to what indigenous women are saying in Mexico and in other areas. So there is, it seems to me, a deeper connection to um, to a kind of uh, not only thought but a kind of activism that has a long history in our country, mm -hmm. five hundred years at least of resistance, right? Absolutely. And so that connection seems incredibly relevant right now, and uh, and obviously we we've seen um, uh, what some people might call violent women destroying the city. Uh, I don't think that is that is what's happening. Uh, I think what we are seeing is rightfully enraged women who are mm -hmm. fed up with what is happening in the country and who are paying very close attention to every single piece of news about yet another femicide that takes place and, and whose uh, perpetrator will never have to face justice, mm -hmm. will never have to face the consequences of their actions. So. Uh, again, the, the origins of the situations are, are rather sad and somber, but at the same time we have this unleashed energy and these young people just willing and able to organize 
and to give it their best. Yes. And so uh, I was um, I was quite taken by by that. Um, uh, re in recent years, just uh, uh, I have um, I have younger friends. I've, I've I've always enjoyed the company of of younger women talented, bright, with new ideas, so I, I pay attention. And, and, and it's been thanks to their camera that, that I've been very much, uh, you know, learning mm -hmm. about what is going on, what is happening, what kind of mobilization is taking place here or there, uh, the many collectives that are forming, uh, and uh, with a very, it seems, a very clear sense of intersectionality. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and, and what is very important to me, which is also uh, uh, the possibility of self-criticism, right? And, mm -hmm. and to, uh, the possibility of looking not only into the difference in terms of gender, but also class and race, and race. Yeah? yeah, and ethnic differences too. Mm -hmm. And I think all of that is very much at stake right now in this range of feminisms. And it seems to me that if we are gonna ever gonna get to the future, it's gonna be through thinking through and with these feminisms, and I know that, that there are many, and I know that uh, the discussion is is deep and uh, and it's passionate as it should be. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, what the kinds of things that I I can think with as as I face the future, I think we cannot dispense with feminism. I mean, we have to think, specifically in in uh, in countries so ravaged by violence against women like Mexico. Although at this stage, you were right. I mean, we're faced, this is a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. There is a global war against women. Mm -hmm. This is not that's something that we can just limit to Mexico. I mean, I speak of Mexico because that's what I'm closer to. But um, we face a fair share of violence against women in this country. It's just that we don't use the word femicide as often as, as we should. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I just keep, I don't, I, my back no, is to I'm you, so that <laughs> you could, okay. Um, yeah, I think, you know, to the, um, when you mentioned the thing about the, the intersectionality, I think that was, that has always been sort of the, the part that, in my experience with Mexico that has been missing, you know, that, I've, you know, I said, of learning, in a, you know, very, very early on, you know, in terms of the women of color movement here in the United States, that a single issue wasn't going to get us anywhere you know, a single issue movement. So the evolution of that, and also that, you know, I, sometimes I think about Bridge and we think about theory in the flesh, and I said, well, that, that's what she's writing here. That's what this, this writer's doing. In other words, that, that, that the, the, the criticism, you know, that our, our criticism comes out as writers, you know, like as well, this writerly relationship, you know, to criticism is, the most effective when it is embodied, yeah. you know? So that is, a, and, and if you can't embody all those sites, which is race, class, g gender, sexuality, I mean, all kinds of things, then, then it's, um, it's only part of the picture, yeah. right? And so I think there is this kind of growing understanding, uh, which also requires, like you said, of, of looking, of turning the lens back on yourself, you know, and, and what's missing, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so I, I, I'm, optim I'm optimistic. Me too. Yes. Me too. Well, th there, there are these women, young women from Ecatepec, for example, which is this area in Mexico City, in so-called periphery of Mexico City. And uh, uh, they've been facing a lot of you know, violence against women. And uh, but most of the demonstrations take place in, uh, in downtown Mexico City, mm -hmm. or in La Roma, yeah. or in, in mm -hmm. La Condesa, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they're saying, well, come to our neighborhoods. Violence is taking place yeah. here. So mm -hmm. uh, even uh, just to get from Ecatepec to these other barrios in in, uh, in central Mexico City is, is is incredibly challenging. It's very complicated. So going the other way around is what is, is what has to happen. And mm -hmm. I think that's just an example of the of the many issues that that uh, that will have to be revised or enacted or just put out there in terms of. Um, you know, the, as critical energy for the movement as such. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting too, and speaking about, you know, in terms of indigenous, you know, thought and indigenous women and, and uh, in terms of feminism is like, I um, I just was recently looking at some of Ma Maria Lugones' work on, on 
women, just on women and trying to kind of unthink even how we understand ourselves as yeah. women from an indigenous perspective. I mean, that, you know, I'm not versed in this. But it gave me, it gave me pause also to um, just about, again, when you're going, we, all of the stuff you're talking about, go, going back to remembering in order to go forward, right? So each one of us, regardless of how, how we're coming into the world, we have to go back to go forward, which means to to the sites of return within our own origin stories. Yeah. You know, that that, and whether you're the most privileged, you know, or the, or the, or the most disenfranchised, it's like, that's all, you know, and I think that's what always gets missing in the picture is that even the most privileged have to go back, yeah. you know, and deal, mm -hmm. and, and deal in that way. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I wanted to make sure we talked about was the, um, about the pandemic, and because you have a whole section on there, which mm -hmm. uh, about it, and the in that sense, you know, grieving is very forward-looking. In the sense, I mean, it brings us quite up to date, because you wrote it when it was still going on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah. I mean, it's still going on now, but I yeah. mean, to the degree that everything was completely, we were all in it isolation. It was the early stages of the pandemic. Yeah. 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 So, um, of course, the, uh, and you have you, you said I would like to. Um, you write I would it, we would do well. And, and you, of course, you bring out exposed all the inequities in our society. I mean, you know, incredibly, you know, and and just and that the whole economic system, of course, is built on profit. So, and who are the ones that are suffering the most? That and you, I love this. You say, the rest of us, all the faculty, et cetera, couldn't be here digitally fulfilling our roles if there weren't many men and women out there bent over the vast vegetable mm -hmm. fields, risking their lives to paradoxically keep living. Right. So, so your critique is 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 you know is very uh, is very right on, and you also then say, we would do well to attend to the questions that rematerialization compels, and in fact makes inescapable, the beginning of the end of indolence, and we mm -hmm. didn't talk enough about indolence, mm -hmm. depends on these answers, and that is something, right. And I, I have to say, I really love when you do something as vague as, and that is something. <laughs> as a writer, I love it because you don't know. Yeah. You don't really know, no. but hey, that's something. You yeah. Know? So let's talk a little bit. Mm -hmm. Do talk a little bit about indolence, and because yeah. you bring mm -hmm. it up a lot. Yeah. Um, and then you really do. Uh, one feels in reading the essay, you know, uh, uh, about the pandemic, that there is something to be known here. And we're going to lose it very, very quick. There's something we're finding out here, and we're going to lose it because we're going to get the vaccine. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah. New normal, right? Yep. But what does that new normal really look like? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we have to be very careful Diligent. about that. Yeah, but um, I've been, th you know, indolence is is in the other side, the other extreme of the language of pain. You know, I. I Think of indolence as a way of uh, militant indifference. Mm -hmm. So we, we require mm -hmm. some indifference just to be functional human beings in our society, you know. But uh, when we are purposefully indifferent, that's when we become indolent. Mm -hmm. When we cannot, uh, in fact, feel the pain of others. And I think, among many other things, writing is very important for that. Write fiction, just mm -hmm. to be able to, for a fleeting moment to be in someone else's shoes. I think that's 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 something. That's something. Mm -hmm, that's, something. <laughs> that's something important. Yes. But what I was thinking uh, in those very early stages, and as you say, I, I didn't know. I was trying just to figure out. I, yeah. I, I didn't have an answer. I was just, uh, I was afraid. Uh, I was trying to pay as much attention as I could. Uh, and, and something that, that, that really um, um, surprised me and how strong it was it, something that I, I, I've been calling the, the rematerialization of, of our worlds. Because somehow, we, we, it seems to me that we live in this society by avoiding pain, we avoid whatever uh, sensation and responsibility to our bodies. And during the early stages of the pandemic, remember that we were told that, uh, that touch could be a means of contagion. And so we had to pay attention to what, what, what were we touching, this, this glass? Right, but who made it? Whose hands were there before mm -hmm. ours? And that is a question about accumulation. Mm -hmm. That is a question about work, about labor, right? Because someone, obviously, is making these things for us. Someone is working in these fields and touching these lettuce and giving mm -hmm. us those radishes. Yes. And so if the pandemic was gonna be forcing us to finally face this basic truth, mm 
which is that, that we live in a world in which many work for us, mm -hmm. right? Many work for, for, to keep this world uh, going as it is. Then this would be, I thought, perhaps optimistically, this would be a, a moment to, to really think critically about that. Mm -hmm. And then remember uh, that um, uh, finally uh, uh, we got to talk about essential workers who, who they could be very essential, as essential as, as uh, the law wanted them to be, but and yet they, they remain in this um, uh, illegal status, right? Mm -hmm. And so who else was going to be doing this work? Whose hands? were placed on these many objects that we were touching and suddenly uh, had become so dangerous to us. Mm -hmm. So thinking about that connection, I thought, was um, a, an important critical moment that we had to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Well, then we, we learned that touching was not as dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. and the, the, <laughs> there were other means for the contagion. And then I thought, well, OK. And the but, title of the piece is Touching is a Verb. Yes, yeah, exactly. Pretty, I mean, yeah, porque yeah. del verbo tocar, mm -hmm. no? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that, I think, brings the whole thing together, the issue of uh, um, centering the body, right? Uh, talking about writing as, as, as a material practice, uh, the connection of writing with others that are also bodies, right? That, that, that what, what language in itself as a material force allows us to, to undertake. And, um, and, and so I thought, well, if finally we're going to be forced to think about labor, which again is we're going to have to think about accumulation, exploitation, mm -hmm. you know, is all this, the connection is, is endless. We go to colonialism, we go to right, right, a, right. Yes. all these other things, right? Uh, and so I think there, there is that, 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 that possibility is still right there as a, as a critical seed that we might want to take somewhere else in our daily lives. Just don't forget the lesson that, that we will never escape our bodies, that we are embodied beings. And as basic as that mm -hmm. is, I think it's, it, it's, uh, we have to keep on repeating it. Otherwise, we are going to be part of these armies of indolence. Yes, and, and that's a real, that's a true danger. When we are unable to feel the pain of others, when we willingly prevent ourselves to feel the pain of others, then something catastrophic is happening to us. And it is happening, oh, happening. to us. Yes. Yes. So yes. We saw people just um, not reacting to, to the tremendous pain of families uh, being broken over the border, mm -hmm. kids in, in cages, things mm -hmm. that, that they could you know, break your heart. And you, and you, you saw people just unable to, to feel just the slightest sense of concern. Uh, we're not even talking about pain, just, the, just the, that kind of uh, recognition of uh, what other bodies go through right here mm -hmm. on this, sh the, this uh, earth that we share, in this land, in this country, in this nation state. So that, that's a true danger. And, and again, that's another reason why I, um, uh, I, I thought, yeah, let's publish the book. Let's talk about pain. Let's well, talk yeah. about dolerse. Yeah. Well, there isn't any um, that I was thinking about in my, in my very sort of rough Zen training. I spent some time, in, you know, really studying sort of Zen Buddhism, and and it, and it, you know, and there was the simplest thing, you know, that then you know in Tibetan Buddhism, I think that that uh, you know you you know you're guaranteed to get sick in this life. You're guaranteed to grow old if you We're live lucky. so long, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and you're guaranteed to die. I mean, those are the three kind of tenets of you know. Of, real, of what is true, true for us, and and I, about what happens to you in your life, if that becomes front burner, like if that becomes conscious on a daily level that you wake up and this is all we got. You know, I always say to my students, I go, "This is all we got right here. This is it. This is it. Mm -hmm. I just go like that, just like that. Go like that." So we have a moment of just this awakening, you know. So how would this moment be different if this is all we got, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so there's, those lessons are being told to us constantly, you know, in, in, in everything we're doing. 
and so there and and there's such avoidance and partly even as you know as a, when we're talking about writing one of the parts that in in teaching writing is that is, is that always I always say well if you're not uncomfortable yeah. nothing's happening I agree you know yeah, <laughs> so totally. it's like yes. you know so I just yeah. say so and and you're going and where do you feel you you will feel it in your body and partly it's the it's, it's, it's trying to get the conciencia, enough awareness where you can actually begin to locate it, yeah. you know? And it, and it yeah. changes the nature of the work, yeah. you know? And because and somehow you feel when you do that then, then you're actually, the, then the work will engage with other bodies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the possibility. That's mm -hmm. the opening, you know? Mm -hmm. Which your work, you know, is very, it's just emblematic of that, you know? It's really yeah, something. But, but that's a challenge, right? Oh, my and, God. And, and every time I think we, we start from um, the ground zero, in a way, you have to... Well, that's the point, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, that, you know, I have to... You know, yes and no. Right. Right. So, I, well, I kind of know if I agree <laughs> okay. with that statement. We have to agree. We're writers. You have to agree. <laughs> no. As the visual person in the room, I don't know. I can't say that because your work was so visual, you know, that I even mm. took it into my dreams. I had mm -hmm. a dream yes. that I've never had before in my life, you know, with metaphors I've never had before with connections I'd never and I and I was telling it to Cherie and I said it has to be from from what I've been reading you know because I've been listening to you and I've been reading it mm. and and but what struck me about this moment in the mito right of our people's lives is that actually there's our people say we've 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 constructed and destructed yeah. many times in yeah. the world and we have now come into the sixth world mm -hmm. But there are the stories. Yeah. There are the stories of how we did that. Yeah. You know, so I always say we do have a blueprint for how to get through this. We just have to remember it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there, I was looking at some of the pre-Columbian materials, you know, to talk about pandemic, to talk about illness, the Kokolishli, for instance, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and then I read that it connected up to this very broad, huge drought that hit, it, we're in it now. We've been in it for about, you know, four years or three years or so. Mm -hmm. And I mean broad that it extends across the country and it's takes a long time to move through the country. And that changes the environment and it changes us. And it and connected to those droughts are also illness. Of course. So mm -hmm. I, I was I so I'm reading about it going, well our people knew how to do this when we were invaded. We were in the process of getting through one. And had and have that information. It's 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 documented in the on the walls and the pottery and you know it, well the books are they've been destroyed but we still have evidence mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. So you're speaking about it. You know, took me back and I said, well, I know you said there's you made a comment about it's not tabula rasa, but yet yeah. you speak of it. When I said to you that you speak of it, you speak of of what you bring. You know what you brought to this moment. Uh, for me, which was, you know, you're talking about this transition, you know, between worlds, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and and you're talking about home, which we all fled from because of its oppressive nature. And yet, when I think about, that's why I was disagreeing, when I think of the ways that my grandmother spoke to me, she kept telling me things and telling me things yeah. and telling me things which I thought were so frightening, but they were the things that she had to pass on. Yeah. Mm -hmm that allows me to reflect back. No, let me tell you something. No, I totally agree with what you're saying. I mean, obviously, um, there are layers of experience and, and, and this past that is never quite the past, right? So we, in fact, I, I, I tend to see writing as, as a way of um, you know, going through those layers, bringing them in and materially in the very process of writing and, uh, and in a way incorporating this context that is in continuous movement and, and it's a continuation. So I, I totally agree. When I said that when we write, we, we start from, uh, from zero, uh, at least that's how I feel at times, is, is in terms of the, um, uh, the techniques, the challenges. Mm -hmm. the, 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 if you are trying to look at the present, then you need to develop uh, some new strategies, new tools, something, just able to capture what is, what is right there in front of you. But, but definitely uh, uh, in terms of what has been happening, in terms of, uh, of this multi-layer process uh, that we are just part of. Yeah. I mean, definitely just trying to denaturalize that, you know, trying to, to find out um, 
not only what is behind us, what is with us, yes. exactly. Mm -hmm. and that, that process that you described so well. And the other thing that I have to mention is that um, there is this um, uh, French writer, let me see if I remember his name, uh, Antoine Volodin, he writes uh, science fiction. Mm -hmm. and, and one day I heard him saying that the best uh, review for him uh, the best thing that a book could bring to his life was not a good review, was not necessarily that people liked the book or didn't like the book, but uh, he thought of um, that a true accomplishment was when the reader dreamt of the book. <laughs> that, that's, that was a proof of something. That had Felicidades. happened. And so I'm right now like, yeah! <laughs> that something is, there is a connection here that goes mm -hmm. well beyond our, uh, our consciousness, right? Yes, it's exactly. touching up on something else. Mm -hmm. And I think as, as writers, I guess, that you are always trying to go for that something else, right? It's, this is a, 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 a long-term relationship, right? See. And that's, that's something that you build on um, uh, going beyond that conscious sphere of, of, of being, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for telling me that <laughs> <laughs> you made it there. <laughs> yeah. Muy bien, muy bien. Well, no, um, we're kind of coming to our, our time here, but um, there's a couple of questions. Some of them you've already answered, and um, I'm just probably going to pick out one here. but. Um, uh, as writers, I just like the phrase, as writers, are we grieving into another world? How does the imagination intersect with the flesh, psyche, the visceral state? Yeah, yeah. That's pretty. That's well, that's an I interesting. I like the line where yeah. we're grieving into, into another, another world. world. Ideally, yeah, right. I would say. Yes. That's what we are saying, I guess. <laughs> Ideally, so. yes. I hope so. That uh, would be it, a good thing. It'd be worth something. <laughs> exactly. That would be yes. something yes. Yeah, to begin yes, with. Yes, because yes. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, if uh, we're ascribing some kind of um, critical um, power to this grieving in, in, in the connection, in the grieving for others, in recognizing us connected to, to our loss and to our living beings around, around us, I think that's a way of bringing into being another world. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, my, my answer would be that, ideally, yes. Yes. ideally yes. 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 And then there's this, um, how do you as a writer face the limitations of language to be able to grasp and articulate the unspeakable of pain and horror of femicidios and the unbearable rawness of the lives of the victims? How do you how do you face those I've been uh, having to uh, I've been answering questions along those lines recently uh -huh. because I, I I was telling both of you on our way over here that um, I just published in in Mexico El Invencible Verano de Liliana which is a telling of of the story of the femicide of my sister mm -hmm. and um, I'm not going to talk a lot about that but but just about that specific question uh, something that I've been repeating is that it's very hard to write a story um, like this, which essentially is the violence of patriarchy with the language of patriarchy, mm. right? Okay, yes. So when, when people ask me, well, how, you know, it's well, been course. 31 years, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, and it could have been more, because it's very difficult just to use the same language that it's designed to, uh, to, um, to create this violence, uh, to blame the victim, to exonerate the perpetrator, it's, it's hard to make that language do something different. And I think that's precisely what, what, where, you, where writing comes into being as a, as a form of, um, of criticism in and of itself, right? Mm -hmm. We have to do something to that specific language so that, so that language can do something that is not designed mm -hmm. to do. Right. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I guess that's uh, that's a way of answering that question. Well, I think in, yeah. I think you touched upon it. I mean, to me, uh, it's about. Uh, I mean, you could say that about. I mean, like the patriarchal language to write about femicide, but you're also talking about, you know, Western language to yes. to talk about. Yes. You know what is not there. What is yeah. not you know now they have all even all the language of decoloniality yeah. is all Western. You know I mean so how you and that's the job of poets. You see that's then yeah. the job of poets. That's mm -hmm. the job of writer that you 
And what I like sometimes about just about your work is that you 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 throw a rough line in. You know, like it can be quite. I mean, just quite beautiful. And then a, a short little punchline comes in that's like a, like a punchline like this, not a punchline joke. A punchline mm -hmm. comes in that's raw, that's just kind of like, and I go, oh, okay, oh good. Mm -hmm. You know, because you, then you, and that's what poetry does, is it tries to capture the embodied feeling yeah. of, of whatever they're describing. And so, in, and, and I think there can be even more of that. You know, but when but then we risk not communicating. Yeah. You see. Yeah. So this is yeah. the dilemma. But sometimes you go. I, I, the real task is to use language differently. Yes. You know. And always. Like, yes. Always. Yes. Always. Yes. You know? Sometimes yeah. this gets called uh, experimentalism, right? And and I know it's a it's a it's a term, a very charged term. Yes. yes, yes. And and the only way in which I I uh, uh, well. I find it useful exactly when, when we're talking about forcing language to do something, mm -hmm. these different types of uh, hegemonic languages mm -hmm. to do something that they are not necessarily created uh, to do. Right. And so if that gets to be called experimental, that's fine. Uh, in, in any ways, it's something that it has to be very, it's, it's consciously done, right? And, and it's not for the sake of form. Uh, all the transformations in terms of all that um, experiments with form, when they are not related to 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 issues like the ones the that we are talking to about, material, yeah. right? to to this yeah. to this struggle, right. uh, to this war, then it's it's just uh, well, you know, you can play, and that's okay. But but it seems to me, that at least in in my own process, it becomes meaningful because I'm I'm trying. To get at one point, I'm, I'm dealing, struggling with this language that that is not giving me what I need right. to to really convey and, and share the, and, and experience. And what the subject requires. Exactly. Requires. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you know, I feel that, and I know you teach, and and you know, so I think the uh, teach creative writers, and you know, what's sometimes amazing to me is is hearing somebody do a piece that they think is usually they think is horrible. As you say, they'll say, mm -hmm. oh, this is, this is no good. And it's so original, mm -hmm. you know, and it's so wrong yeah. compared to what the, the standards of what it's supposed to be like, you know, yeah. what, what we understand mm -hmm. is good writing. And I, it, 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 those moments give me incredible joy, yeah. you know. And then, then the trouble is trying to convince them it's great, you know, because <laughs> cause we've been so indoctrinated about yeah. what is the right, you know. And mm -hmm. so the originals, I think particularly that's why I like working a lot with first-generation writers. Because, because, you know, they don't have as many generations <laughs> behind yeah. them of, yeah. of censorship, you yeah. know. And mm -hmm. also it's very oral. And so when we tell stories, it's like when somebody was just telling you, you know, like some of the stories that, that she was just saying about the dream, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, what, it's like you're going, then you try to put that on the page and it's a different kind of work, oh, yeah. you know. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we could talk about writing for a long time. Yeah, but, but I agree. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> so um, we... I think we should. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we want to um, close with a, a piece. But what I'm gonna do before we close is I want to do my thank yous, and then so we can just end on this last note um, that you and me sharing this piece oh, yes, of yours, yes, right? Yes, sure. Yes. Um, so I just, um, well, obviously, th thank you, Christina. Oh, thank very, you. Very, very much. much. It's been a pleasure to be to be with you and get to know you in this way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Celia, so much, <laughs> so much. Um, so uh, I also want to thank Maya, um, our associate director, who it was really the person who organizes all of this stuff for us, and um, also Stephanie Ruby, our publicist, Mariela Aguilar, our program coordinator, and graduate research assistant, our interns, Yesenia, um, Angel, and Vanessa, and all the folks here, you know, in this uh, media center, Alma Trejo Rodriguez, who is you know really key and 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 provides all the leadership for this. Um, Erica Snell, Avery Wheeler, um, and the whole Kerr Media Center. Um, we we'll ask you please subscribe to Las Maestras if you haven't done it, to, and see our Instagram and do all of that. Um, please remember too that next week we will have the final gathering of the five writers, including me as a writer. I hope someone's going to ask me a question now. So, <laughs> no, so we will all be together and it'll be uh, same, same time at five o'clock. 
uh, next Thursday, and that'll be the closing um, of our uh, of our series. So I'm very grateful to all of you. So do keep showing up, and we're going to close with this ofrenda for you that um, I really uh, asked. I had asked Christina to please uh, let us hear her uh, Spanish writing voice, uh, and so what we're going to do is she will read. Uh, this is from Keep Writing, and she mm -hmm. will, which is the end of the book, and she will read in Spanish, and I will do my best to read in English. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, for this conversation. It's it's been a real privilege. I admire very much your work, and it's been uh, very important in uh, in helping me understand my own world and what I've been going through right here. So. It's it's a through through pleasure pleasure to be here. Thank you. All right. Seguir escribiendo. Porque nos volvemos sociales en el lenguaje. Mi yo de ti, tu tú, mío de mí, nuestro ustedes de ellos. Because we become social in language. My I for you, your you for me, our y'all for them. Porque la escritura, por ser escritura, invita a considerar la posibilidad de que el mundo puede ser, de hecho, distinto. Because writing by nature invites us to consider the possibility that the world can, in fact, be different. Porque el mecanismo secreto del texto es la imaginación. Because the secret mechanism of writing is imagination. Porque la imaginación es otro nombre de la crítica y este el otro nombre de la subversión. Because imagination is another word for criticism, and this, the other word for subversion. Porque el que escribe no se adaptará jamás. Because those who write will never adapt. Porque la memoria. Because memory. Porque la oración produce la memoria donde habitarán para siempre los nombres de Marco y José Luis Piña Dávila, Ciudad Juárez, Chihuahua, enero 30, 2010. Because a sentence produces memories that will be inhabited by the names of Marco and Jose Luis Piña Davila, Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, January 30th, 2010. Porque pertenecer es algo que hago a través de ti, oración. Because belonging is something I do through you, the sentence. Porque hay un abismo al final de cada línea por la que vale la pena despeñarse o lanzarse o desaparecer. Because at the end of each line, there is an abyss worth tumbling into, or launching yourself into, or disappearing into. Porque mira cómo se arranca de sí el verbo arrancar. Because look how the verb to burst bursts out of itself. Porque una línea es una imprecación o un rezo. Because a line is an imprecation or a prayer. Porque el terror se detiene ahí donde se detiene inscrita la palabra terror. Because terror stops there, where the word terror stops inscribed. Porque hay voces que vienen de lejos, de abajo, de más allá. Because there are voices that come from afar, from below, from beyond. Porque un párrafo es un deporte extremo. Because a paragraph is an extreme sport. Porque el lenguaje es una forma del no, que siempre nos lleva a otra parte. Because language is a form of opposition that always takes us elsewhere. Porque es solo a través de la escritura que se funda el aquí, porque el ahora. Because it is only through writing that the here is founded, because the now. Porque en el rectángulo de la página me alimento y sueño y me zambullo y muero. Porque ahí también renazco, renacemos. Because in the rectangle of a page, I am nourished, and I dream, and I plunge, and I die. Because there, too, I am reborn. We are reborn. Porque la palabra esquirla, la palabra soldado, la palabra impunidad. Because the word shard, the word soldier, the word impunity. Porque ante las preguntas, ¿Vale la pena levantarse en la mañana temprano solo para seguir escribiendo? ¿Puede la escritura de hecho algo contra el miedo o el terror? ¿Desde cuándo una página ha tenido una bala, ha detenido una bala? 
¿Ha utilizado alguien un libro como escudo sobre el pecho, justo sobre el corazón? ¿Hay una zona protegida de alguna manera invencible alrededor de un texto? ¿Es posible, por no decir deseable, empuñar o blandir o alzar una palabra? Mi respuesta sigue siendo sí. Because when faced with the questions, is it worth it to get up early in the morning just to keep writing? Can writing, in fact, be something that acts against fear or terror? Since when has a page stopped a bullet? Has someone ever used a book as a shield over their chest, just above their heart? Is there a protected zone somewhere invincible around a written text? Is it possible not to mention desirable to grip or wield or raise a word? My answer continues to be yes. Porque sí es una palabra diminuta y sagrada y salvaje al mismo tiempo. Because yes is a small and sacred and savage word all at the same time. Porque yo no olvido, porque no olvidaré, porque no olvidaremos. Because I do not forget, because I will not forget, because we will never forget. Gracias. Gracias. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you.